and welcome to that conference and sit down interviews with Pangea. Today we have Kirsten. Yeah. Welcome, Kirsten. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I've been doing developer advocacy um, for various companies since about 2005. I've worked at Netflix and LinkedIn and Akamai and Cisco. Um, and I wrote a book uh, called Irresistible APIs. You can find it on Amazon or you can go to the Manning site if you don't want to buy something from Amazon. I get it. Um, and uh, right now I work for Datastax. Um, we do Cassandra in the cloud. It's a wonderful product. Um, one of the things about Cassandra is that people find it very challenging to get started and manage. I mean, they feel like they have to go through an entire um, week of, of learning in order to get it going. But with Astra, it's managed by us. Oh, that's awesome. And it, there's actually a free tier that's, that's really quite generous. You can probably run a small company. Um, you can have 80 gigs of memory. You can have 5 million reads. You can have um, 1 million writes. And the other thing that I re I'm really proud of for our company is that that um, database that you get, um, it you get a the $25 uh, bonus, which allows you to pay for it, and that's the free tier. But we don't ask you for your credit card when you sign up. That's amazing. What happens is if you use your database enough that you start bumping up on that $25, then we send you an email and say, do you want to put a credit card in or do you want it to just stop until the end of the month and then start again? So that's if you're just doing, um, you know, development and testing and playing or uh, any of our hundred workshops, literally a hundred <laughs> workshops on YouTube, um, then it's fine if it goes down for a few days at the end of the month and then you just bring it up again. Wow, that's a that's a that's a whole lot to dive into. So I'm really excited to chat with you. I guess starting off, uh, this is the question that we ask everybody. Yeah. So, uh, what is your favorite tech stack that you worked with? Um, I like uh, what we use, which is React, um, and it is Node, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have Cassandra on the back end, and then we use Netlify to um, to share the the sample applications so that people can play with them. Okay. So, um, so I'm a JavaScript girl. JavaScript girl, awesome. Okay, that's that's really great to know because yeah, that seems like. It's kind of the preeminent framework right now, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, My okay. talk at the conference was actually about that. Really? Um, and you can put a link to the repository because it's designed to be a self-service workshop. Yeah. And so people can just play with uh, GraphQL and our databases and make a little Netflix clone, <laughs> which is cute. So. That's amazing. I'm I'm curious then because you're in, in the business of data. Right. <laughs> um. If what if there's any kind of like security measures with respect to that data? Is that data secure? Is there? It is definitely. Or? It is definitely secure. We're very very protective of our customers' data. Um, we have not just Astra, but we also have an, an enterprise version. Okay. So for instance, FedEx uses our enterprise version. Wow. And um, they've been our customer for around nine years, and they have had zero downtime. That's amazing. Wow. That's that's like and their and their database is not you know simple, uh, it's very complicated. There's a lot of different moving pieces, but but they have they did a great job of architecting what they wanted, and our team you know helps them out wherever we can to make sure that if there's a change, right. you know we can smoothly get it into the whole system. Wow, yeah. What does that rollout system look like? I'm I have no I, I have no idea, but we have a whole team that's devoted to to FedEx. Wow. Okay. I guess, how do you think that's affected your the company culture at all? Which um, being pretty much reliant on open source software. Well, the, the company was built around Cassandra and then made it open source. Okay. So um, we're actually, I think we do quite well. Mm -hmm. um, the really big companies like Apple and Netflix, they have their own um, yeah, Cassandra instances. And it is one of the case places where actually those people also contribute back to to Cassandra. So it's a it's very much a community, um, and it's just amazing if you need a lot of throughput 
or um, if you need to make sure that your system never goes down. Um, it's got just a lot of fun. So one, I guess, one required question that's on my list of questions. It's like everybody's talking about AI, right? Oh, like you hear it ev everywhere. They're trying to put AI in your Uber Eats app, yep. and AI in your Snapchat filters, AI in your, you know, generative AI or ChatGPT. New AI in the Uber app yeah, is run on Cassandra. Cassandra. I was just about <laughs> to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, I was like, do you guys have any uh, <laughs> footnotes in that? Uh, so, so, um, so there's a couple of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, one is that we um, acquired Cascada, mm -hmm. who is a real time AI uh, company. Yeah. And, um, and we are doing a, a fairly hard pivot to real time AI. Um, in fact, our bosses tell us that we must every day use either chat gpt or copilot or just for something it could be anything okay it could, and um and, and they come into slack and they poke at you hey you what are you doing with chat gpt today <laughs> so that's actually pretty fun um i did want to mention um that can i give a description of, of vector search and how it works yeah please do so one of the things that we did in the last couple of months is we added vector search to astra and then we pushed it to the uh, enterprise, and now we're pushing it out to uh, the Cassandra main core. Um, but I, what I've noticed is that a lot of people really don't know what that means. Why, what is vector search? What does it even do? How is it different from other machine learning? So I'll tell you the first part. You can go, um, I, there's a, a PDF that I'm gonna make sure that is available uh, to learn about uh, vector uh, search and a generative API in a more general sense so that you can understand it. But basically forget all you know about how to train models and things like that. It's a different process. So what happens is there's a thing called an embedding and there's different embeddings. There's, um, there's OpenAI, uh, there's uh, Google One, um, and there's yeah, Hugging Face, you might have heard of. So what those are going to do is they're going to give a value for the chunk of text um, that can be put in the database. So you start out, you've got Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. right? So you want to be able to ask it things like, how did Juliet die, right? These are, these are very important questions. So, and we wouldn't want our bead. Than AI play. No, that, no that, that's it's not fun. Yeah. All right. And and so let's say we chunk it and we chunk it into what are good size pieces of of, of text. Um, it's going to be good for it to be a few paragraphs. And then the next one, you're going to have to make it overlap some because even though it's only going to take the terms that are in the main body of it, having the previous paragraph to see what the other context they can glean about um, that particular use of the term um, is is very valuable. So that makes your, um, it's going to make your answers better. They're not going to be um, hallucinations uh, from the system. So so you've taken all your, your, your play and you've put it in the database and now you're going to have a separate column. And in that column, each chunk is going to be analyzed by whatever say open AI, open AI, it's going to go through 1,536 um, different ways to look at that particular piece of information, and then you're going to put it in the database. So now you have a bunch of chunks of data and a vector score for them. So now what happens? Well, what you do is you take, you get a query that you want to see what the answer, what answers are around uh, that in the neighborhood. So you embed it just like you embedded the actual content. And then you tell the database, I want you to find me similar things to that based on the vector score. And so um, here again, you have some choices. Um, you can use known nearest neighbor. Um, that is a terrible algorithm and you shouldn't use it because it means that every single vector 
in the space has to be evaluated to see what the five closest values are. So not a good choice. Um, approximate nearest neighbor, it's very, very popular. And what that does is it sort of says, well, give me five things that are close to this. And my, my bar is it has to be 95% similar or 90% similar. And that's faster because it goes and it finds things that match that and gives it back. So now you have all these chunks of data. Well, what do you do with them now? It's, I mean, you've done the vector search, but now you just have random paragraphs. And what you, what you then do is you feed those into a language learning mo model. And what it's going to do is based on the rules that you told it, like, Imagine that the person is five years old and they're in Kentucky um, and, you know, use, use a lot of explanation. You know, all those things, the LLM will take all that data that you gave it and it will create, craft an answer to the query that was given to it. So that's how the process works now. Um, it's much easier than it used to be to train those models. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That cool. makes sense. One kind of final question to wrap up the formal interview yeah. portion of this is um, uh, where do you see, I guess, this industry going in the next five or 10 years? Well, I think we're going to continue to get a lot calmer about AI okay. because um, we're going to be able to see that it's not good at everything that we're good at. Right. Um, I think we'll get more comfortable um allowing it to give us a kickstart of something like I need to write a spec about this and this and this and this and this and then it writes it and of course it's not your spec but it's got all the parts in it and then you just fill them in and it's great so I I think I hope that people are going to not feel as threatened as they do by um, like Copilot and ChatGPT um, writing code for them all right and Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Oh, thanks for having me. It was yeah. great talking to you. It was great chatting with you too.